Profile Coin Singapore. How are you? Hi. Welcome, everyone. It is a great honor for all of us and for our whole community to be here with Andrew today. Um, he's been such a great force for optimism and progress in the world. You've helped reshape a lot of ideas. You've helped advance critical um, uh, the development of many ideas. You've popularized UBI. Uh, the whole world owes, owes you a great debt of gratitude just for that work already done. Of course, a long, long road to follow. Um, and you're now tackling one of the biggest issues of our time, which is the massive polarization of the world. Um, and, and along the way, you all, all talk about your mission to end poverty in the world, which is absolutely critical. So why don't we start there? Um, talk to us about uh, the current state of poverty, um, why it matters so much, and what are you doing? Well, thank you, Juan. It's a pleasure to be here with you, with you today. Uh, it was my first time in Singapore, which is something I'm very happy to remedy because this is a, a, a phenomenal place. Uh, I ran for president to try and mainstream a, a few big ideas. One you and I discussed which is that artificial intelligence is coming online in a way that was going to fundamentally transform the labor market in the United States. Uh, and that I thought that was going to make things, unfortunately, less rational less prone to solutions and problem solving. And I believe that universal basic income, uh, if you have a functional path forward, would be an inevitability. So if you think that's the case and you want to try and bring the future forward as quickly as you can, you know? <laughs> One of the, the arguments I made was that, look, the genie might not get in the back in the bottle. Like, if you let uh, American society get to a certain point, it's not like you can necessarily bring everyone back to the table and make them rational uh, and, and cooperative again. So I, I ran the mainstream universal basic income, and the approval rating of universal basic income went from 27% when I started to 65% uh, when uh, my campaign ended. Uh, so those of you who are part of my campaign, thank you. We made a huge impact in helping people understand that we have to think bigger about how to address poverty, not just in the US, but around the world. Yeah. And how do you think that, I mean, there's a lot of work that many nations and many uh, foundations and many individual people do to try and end poverty. Uh, what do you think is having the greatest impact right now? And, and what do you th think are good opportunities for like the short and midterm? Well, uh, at least in the US, uh, the, the problems are persistent. Uh, it's one reason why I'm still doing what I'm doing. So after I came off the presidential trail, um, I still felt very despondent about the, the, the direction of things. I was like, oh, we, we did it. Like, we solved all the problems. Um, uh, and so uh, I now am trying to help uh, modernize the American political system to be more able to, uh, to make progress. Uh, when it comes to eradicating poverty, I see two main paths. Number one is that nation states start taking care of their people to a higher degree, say, look, we have the resources. In the US, US GDP comes out to something like seventy-eight or $80,000 a head, uh, which is enough so that if you wanted to get rid of poverty, you could. Uh, now, unfortunately, the US political system is very far from trying to tackle that in earnest. Uh, there was this very, very positive enhanced child tax credit that passed, but then was taken away in January of this year, which made me super sad because it had, it had already brought millions of American families out of poverty. Um, so that's path number one. Get governments uh, to implement something like a UBI. Path number two is through Web3, in my opinion, which is building new ways uh, of organizing and governing and energizing communities, and then also building more inclusive financial networks and systems that can get value into people's hands uh, maybe in ways that are independent of, for example, like fiat currencies, like the USD. So I'm still very, very passionate about trying to end poverty. I think it's a, a necessary step for us to be able to solve any of the other problems. And I think that it's either going to be through governments or through Web3. And so I'm trying to accelerate both of those as quickly as I can. Let's dig into these. So uh, with UBI, can you... Uh, of course, explain to the audience again what UBI is. I think uh, in, in a few years we won't have to anymore, uh, but just help everyone understand why it matters, why it can work in our modern economies, 
and, and what are some of the great results that we have seen so far? Um, so raise your hand if you know what UBI is. Let's try that. I can see some of you enough. Um, wow, well, you're right. Some of them don't know. <laughs> you're right, Wad. You can read the audience very well. Uh, UBI is universal basic income. It's a policy where every person in a society, let's say every citizen of a nation state, gets a baseline amount of money to meet their basic needs. So when I was running for president, I said, let's have it uh, be $1,000 a month, uh, which I called the freedom dividend because it tested better among conservative Americans <laughs> if it had the word freedom in it. I mean, just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, the poverty level at the time was a little bit above um, the $12,000 a year level. So I thought, OK, $12,000 would be a, a great foundational step. Uh, you can imagine in different countries, it might be a, a, a different amount. Um, so that, that's uh, the idea that's been around for generations. Uh, Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the U.S. Martin Luther King was for it. Uh, he was actually fighting for it when he was assassinated. Um, economists like Milton Friedman have been for a version of it. So th this was not Andrew Yang's idea. It was just an idea that was uh, dormant and, and needed to be uh, amplified. It was such a breath of fresh air for so many of us who knew about these ideas and knew about these possibilities to hear finally someone actually running for president talking about them seriously in the US. It's, it's like these really critical economic ideas are somehow banned from, from government or banned from policy. And it was so refreshing to hear like clear thinking and a forward outlook um, in your campaign. So thank you for that. Um, where do we stand with um, UBI today? Like, what are some of the experiments or results that you're most excited about? And um, what do you think we need to show for that first path for governments to take it more seriously and, and actually do it? Yeah, more and more data is coming out. All the data is very, very positive. This child tax credit I mentioned earlier, uh, the money went to food, school supplies, uh, uh, car repairs, th things that help keep those families functional um, and make it so that their kids had a better chance to learn and also eat well. I mean, uh, like really, really basic stuff. Uh, now there are dozens, perhaps hundreds, of cities in the US that are rolling out very ba various basic income trials. Um, and, and they're collecting data on those trials. To the extent that they've gotten that data, it's been almost uniformly uh, positively transformative. They've focused on different groups in different cities. So there's a southern city where it's single moms. Uh, in another town in California, it's people coming out of foster care. So, that, so some of them are targeting uh, specific groups and then trying to determine whether the money helps. I can actually just cut to the end. I can like save them some, some time and trouble. The money will help. <laughs> you know, I mean, It's something that I think everyone here could, can see pretty clearly. Um, and, and if you think about the way that countries will try and address some of these social needs, there's direct economic transfer, and then there's an, a program that is meant to help those people that often ends up creating a bureaucracy that then has its own, um, frankly, like, you know, whether it works or not, like the bureaucracy will probably persist. And then the, the people that are supposed to help often become kind of secondary to the program or the, the agency you start. And it seems to me that um, for the last few centuries, most of the governments today uh, were sort of engineered in the 1700s, like the policies and forms of government and so on were designed around that time. Of course, there were some big changes in the 20th century, but um, many of the, of the economies that uh, are running today are still based on structures that, that haven't really changed much in, in that <laughs> yeah, span of sure. time. Um, so how, like, from my perspective, a lot of our governments, especially the US, is not yet um, ready for the massive change about to come from technology. So the AI systems that will emerge will be able to generate massive amounts of economic value decoupled from humans. So the, the idea from the um, agrarian revolution and industrial revolution that everybody should have a job in order to earn some money so that they can pay for living is going to go away eventually. Now the question is how do we transition our economies to be able to preserve um, human rights and preserve human access to these basic needs. And uh, you know, UBI, from my point of view, is like a great uh, solution. We have to scale it to, to be able to work. 
Um, but maybe on this economic thing, what are some of the other shifts that you think are like coming down the pike around um, like economies? And, and, and this is, I think, what led you to Web3, where you see some amount of the experimentation. What, um, what are you most excited about? Like, what's the promise? What is the potential? Uh, and, and how do you think it, this can affect this like new other direction can, can, um, can start uh, providing lessons for the first one? Uh, well, there are some countries uh, that are further along, in my opinion. The, the U.S. is something of a gerontocracy. I don't know if you noticed uh, yeah. <laughs> that. that uh, Never before, by the way. Like uh, all the prior congresses were much younger. Uh, yeah, uh, it, I mean, it, it's gotten really uh, ridiculous <laughs> lately. I mean, the, the two most likely presidential contenders in 24 will be uh, Trump, Biden, the rematch. Yeah. Uh, and their combined age will be 159, uh, <laughs> which seems excessive. So, uh, so the U.S. unfortunately has a bit of a tape delay. Uh, it has a tape delay because of the age of its leaders who don't understand technology in the least. I mean, you, you track down the average. So the average uh, senator is 64. Uh, the average member of Congress is 58, 59. Um, and those are the averages. If you look at the leadership, it's uh, 70s and 80s. Nancy Pelosi's 81, to give you a, a sense of it. Um, and, and so they, they don't have the foggiest notion of what's going on in, in technology. Um, and, and if you look at the people who actually control the voting in the US, they also tend to be in their 50s and 60s. The average CNN viewer is 59, the average Fox viewer is 64. I, I mean, it's probably distressing to you that I know all these numbers, but I, I do, yeah. <laughs> because I've dug into it. Um, so if, if those of you who are looking at the U.S. being like, wow, the U.S. seems a little bit behind the, t the curve, behind the times, it's like uh, there are structural reasons why. Um, so there are other parts of the world, uh, including Taiwan, where I'm going to be heading a little bit later this year, where they are actually uh, experimenting and innovating with, ver with different ways to organize uh, communities, and they say, look, let's try it in, in this district or this neighborhood and then see if we can scale it. Um, so I, I, I'm, again, tr going down two tracks simultaneously. I'm trying to drag certain American institutions uh, toward the future, and then simultaneously I'm interested in building and piloting uh, solutions that can be scaled up and then uh, uh, hopefully uh, already be ready for prime time. Yeah, and that whole track of work of uh, Audrey Tang and the team there at uh, the ministry is fantastic. It's super exciting. It's some of the most exciting governance work going on worldwide. Um, actually blending governance with digital um, systems, with computers, with mobile phones. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, so as you look to Web3, like what, what are the kind of, what is the potential, right? So a lot of the world um, doesn't yet see, like the, the crypto space is still quite small. Like uh, it's much larger today than it was 10 years ago, of course. But it's still quite small relative to the macro systems of the world, to the mega economies. Um, what do you think is the, is the promise here? How, what are the kinds of things that we can test and build and try out um, so that we can scale them to, to solve them macro, macro problems? Uh, so uh, one of the, uh, the things I'm most excited about would be new ways of energizing and organizing communities where, um, and I, I'm, again, I apologize I'm talking about the states a lot, but you know, it, it, it's uh, where, where I've been focused. Um, there are a lot of American towns that have become depleted, uh, and the things that used to tie that community together, whether it's uh, a church or a nonprofit um, or, or a factory or whatever it was, like, uh, have become diminished. And so the question is, how can you actually reintroduce ways so that people can participate in uh, and exchange value within that, that kind of community? Uh, and I think that Web3 uh, could be the answer in developing localized currencies and ways so that you can generate value uh, by volunteering at a nonprofit or helping your neighbor or tutoring a, a school child or, or something that most people are able to do. Um, because to your earlier point, Juan, AI is going to wipe out a lot of the traditional income generating opportunities. One of the things that I, I said to people is like, look, there are two million plus Americans who still work at call centers picking up phones. When do you think AI is gonna be able to re replace that job? Uh, like, raise your hand if you think it's gonna be in the next 12 months. <laughs> no, some hands going up, good, good stuff. Um, some of you are like, right now, you know? I mean, the, the, the fact is, in some of these cases, 
the firm just hasn't gotten around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah gotten I think you can do it. You can do it now. Some of the results in the last few months show that it can be done. Now it'll be about scaling and diffusing it to a lot of corporations, which will be, you know, three to three to five years tops. Yeah, um, and, and that's one obvious one, but there are dozens of inobvious ones, uh, and it's not just. Uh, uh, blue collar phenomenon. I mean, uh, AI is getting powerful enough to be able to replace journalists, designers, yeah. uh, artists in some cases. I, you know, I mean, the stuff is very, very profound uh, yeah. in, in terms of its ability to uh, uh, to outperform humans at like, creative work. Um, well, one thing that I'm actually kind of excited about, but that you wouldn't think, is, is that uh, AI has been demonstrated to be more effective at providing therapeutic services to military veterans. Because it turns out military veterans prefer talking to a bot uh, to a human. Like if they talk to a human, they're like, they just clam up and get self-conscious. So, um, so there are, are things that technology can, and most people would be like, oh, technology could never replace a therapist, because like a therapist seems like the most human of all professions, but, but that's, not, that's not really the case. So uh, the, the impact of AI, uh, is uh, in some circles vastly underestimated. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so as we, uh, can you maybe speak to to some of the projects that you're uh, uh, working on in, in the crypto space? Like there's Golden Dow um, and Samarity and Lobby Three. Yeah. Sure. I'll, I guess I'll go in chronological order. So uh, so the first one was Lobby Three, which was meant to try to introduce some rationality uh, into DC's approach to regulating uh, Web3, because there was a fear that it was going to get politicized, which, by the way, happens to 95% of things in American life now, <laughs> where uh, one side is for it, the other side is against it. Um, and, and there was a very, very real hazard, and is a very real hazard, that Web3 falls into that bucket, uh, where one party decides to demonize it and the other party um, supports it. So Lobby3 is meant to try to counteract that, uh, one of the things that Lobby 3 did that I was excited about is we worked with the uh, League of Mayors so that ma mayors of both parties stood up and said, hey, I, I like uh, these tools and, and technologies. I think that they, they provide uh, real opportunities. Um, and I, I have now some sense of how things do and don't happen in DC. And so we have a team of lobbyists uh, working on these issues. Um, they're working on a, a, a few issues. One is trying to get cash relief uh, across, but another is trying to depoliticize um, Web3. So that's Lobby3, very exciting. The, the second is Golden Dow, which is, uh, I believe it may, may have been the, the first social activist Dow for uh, Asian Americans in Web3, or not even Asian Americans, pretty much Asians and Asian Americans. Um, uh, and the thesis of that was that there are so many people working in Web3 uh, uh, from Asia that could use a community to support each other, get together. Um, and in America, there is this real surge in anti-Asian hate, uh, and Golden Dow is meant to try to uh, galvanize efforts to counteract that uh, and call attention to it. Um, and then the third is Samarity, which is uh, meant to try and supercharge volunteerism. Uh, along the way of these localized currencies that I was describing. So if any of those things are interesting to you, please do um, check them out. But I, I think that there is a, a lot of opportunity, and we're just scratching the surface of what can be done. Yeah, and what are the, some of the problems that you're most excited to tackle now, like based on the learnings that you had through these projects, like what are the kind of like next, uh, next things ahead? Well, uh, I guess I'll talk about DAOs and governance for a little bit. So I, I joke that DAOs are like those projects we did in college uh, where a few people do all the work yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then, then other people are sort of around, like free ride. Um, uh, and you know, I, I think in a way that's human nature uh, uh, and that there is an opportunity for us to recognize human nature and then try and um, make it so that things shift based upon who's outperforming and who's taking on a lot of responsibility and who's investing a lot of time and energy um, uh, and make it so that th those folks have some sort of uh, augmented role. Um, but when you look at the way at least, in a, uh, at least the way American democracy works, one of the things I joke about is that 
if you have a two or four year term, it's both too much time and too little time. Like it's too much time because maybe something happens during that time where you're like, hey, I'd like to provide input on that. <laughs> I'd like to be able to vote on, uh, on this decision that you're making. And then it's too short a time in that, that as soon as they get in office and they're turning around and trying to uh, win re-election and raise money uh, and the rest of it. Um, so if you can introduce more responsive uh, and transparent governance mechanisms, I think that would be a, a massive step forward. And that's not just an American phenomenon, that could be anywhere. And, and as you're talking about engaging these communities and engaging um, these DAOs, you, you started happening upon the importance of, um, yeah, engage, as you were saying earlier, engaging community members, getting them to, to work on their local communities. What is, what, is the, um, what is the potential traction that you see there and like, what are the interesting experiments ahead that, uh, that you're excited to try? I, I, I want us to demonstrate success within a particular community um, that could take a, a, a whole range of different forms. I tend to think about impoverished communities. Uh, impoverished communities can take different forms. Uh, you know, it could be uh, uh, a village in Africa. Um, it could be in America. It could be a rural area that is losing its uh, livelihoods. Uh, it could be an ur urban environment of uh, underrepresented minorities who are on the outside looking in. So that there are different areas where there's a lot of philanthropic interest and a lot of, um, frankly, like a, a track record of organizations not being able to, to solve the problem. Um, so how many of you have heard of an organization called Give Directly? Have you heard of Give Directly? Anyway, what Give Directly did, um, Give Directly put money into the hands of poor African villagers. Uh, and what they've done is they've kind of leapfrogged the work of various NGOs, where NGOs said, hey, give us money and then we'll alleviate poverty in Africa. And then you come back decades later and you're like, hey, people here are still poor. And then you're like, well, you know, and then they just like want more. And, and the data showed that Give Directly was doing a much better job of actually lifting people out of poverty by um, directly transferring wealth. So there are a lot of environments where I think we could demonstrate something similar uh, and hopefully supplant some of the legacy institutions that have uh, become more about themselves than the people that they're meant to serve. How can the Falcon community uh, contribute to these? Like, uh, what is like the call to action for a community to help? Uh, is there like a project that we should go join right now? Is there, there a thing that we should do? Is there something that we should try to do uh, ourselves? Well, gosh. I mean, uh, it's one reason I love, love being in a, uh, an environment like this of builders and innovators and uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, you're all probably intent on tackling uh, uh, an issue or a problem right now. I mean, the stronger the system gets, the better. For me, uh, like my push would be to try and build projects that access people that aren't in this kind of environment. You know what I mean? Like, like where, where there are a lot of people who still don't understand Web3 in the least. They don't think it's relevant to them. Uh, that They, they, they uh, certainly don't think it's going to be able to solve the problem that they're, they're looking at every day. So if you can expand to that kind of community, like that, that's where I want us to go. Um, if we're doing stuff amongst ourselves, uh, and if you fast forward and it's still like the same set of people, you know, two, three years from now, I, I would see that as a failure. So what, what I would urge you all to do is to try and solve problems for people who right now don't think that Web3 is actually going to improve their lives. What do you all think? Can you, um, what do you think of the strategies of just onboarding hum all humans onto crypto and getting a wallet so that we can then start airdropping UBI and have you know, a yeah. test of like many projects. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Uh, so if you're poor, and this has been demonstrated in, uh, you know, in a lot of contexts, but um, you don't care how you get uh, access to value. You, you don't care about the nature of the currency. You just care that you can use it to address your need, to yeah. solve your problem. Uh, uh, and one of the things that I think is a massive opportunity is that the legacy financial systems uh, have left a lot of people on the outside. Yeah. Uh, and 
the, the people that are on the outside are kind of immaterial to those systems. So if, if we can get to them uh, and put value in their hands, then you can build the next generation financial system. Um, it helps humanity, can build something uh, immensely valuable, puts pressure on the legacy institutions to perform better. Yep. Uh, so, and thank you so much for all of the um, important work that you're doing. As you, one of the things I love talking to people about is their optimistic visions for the future. There's so much to think about in the future that is dangerous and concerning and uh, frustrating and so on. So it's very easy to get demoralized seeing all of the problems. Uh, you're somebody who has been able to like just push against the hardest obstacles on the planet, like the massive uh, legacy macro systems, like the financial institutions, the, uh, the various political parties, uh, the governments in themselves. Um, how, like, tell us about your optimistic vision for the future. How, how do you imagine the world um, uh, coming to like, a much better state? Like, maybe think, um, paint a picture for us, like, help us uh, visualize like you. Well, so fundamentally, the conflict uh, worldwide is between abundance and scarcity. And you have mindsets of abundance and optimism and possibility. And I'm going to suggest that most of the people in this room, uh, or even watching this, probably uh, participate in this mindset. And then there's a mindset of scarcity where if you win, I lose. Uh, so I don't necessarily want you to win. Uh, like my needs may or may not be met. I've got a negative view of the future. And so when you talk about change, like I actually close up. Uh, which of those two do you think is winning in the world right now? I'll leave it to you to answer that internally. <laughs> so you're not going to be all yelled. So, you know, what, what I'm going to suggest is that uh, we need the, the first one to win. Um, if the second one wins, it's going to be a bad thing for everyone, uh, you know, like regardless of your, your situation. Um, uh, and, and so when I get optimistic, uh, I think about things I can actually expand the mindset of abundance and optimism to, to more people. And I reflect on the fact that we are at an historic moment in human history where we actually have the resources and means to be able to solve many of these problems and address uh, everyone's needs in a way that was not the case before. Um, I, you know, I said before, like, US GDP is about 80,000 ahead. Like, that was not true, uh, you know, a generation or two ago. Now, the, the American economic system and mindset in many ways is still programmed for scarcity. It's not programmed for abundance. Uh, no, I, I, I'm trying to help change that. Um, and, but that's true in a lot of different contexts. If you look at Web3, a lot of this space didn't exist X years ago. And now, you know, if you wanted to put a dollar value on it, I mean, you're still looking at hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of value that did not exist before. Filecoins, you know, like, uh, I think 1% of cloud storage after like a year, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's an enormous uh, scale is possible very quickly. Um, and, and so if you, if you take the resources that are possible and have them reach their potential, we genuinely can eradicate poverty in our time. Uh, and that's what gets me excited, because a generation or, or two ago, you couldn't have said that. Yeah, absolutely true. I look at the, the charts showing the growth of crypto networks, and they've already passed many nation states. <clears throat> they've already passed many nation states in terms of um, the scale, in terms of their, their, their worth and, and issuance and so on. If we can scale crypto by another 10, uh, 100x, 1,000x, these crypto networks will be larger or as, as large as the largest nation states. And that's a level of financial power that can be routed towards a lot of these problems, right? So if we, for example, today find good ways of allocating these resources to underserved communities, to build regenerate system, regenerative systems, to create these, these um, abundant systems, um, and then we can kind of today lock in some distribution towards public goods into these crypto networks now. So as they, their scale, all of that distribution will, will scale alongside. And you can end up funding massive amounts of R&D and, and, and uh, uh, poverty reduction and so on. Um, you know, it's kind of crazy to me that the, the total spend of the US in terms of um, R&D is like actually achievable like crypto networks in the next 10 years. Like that's 
That's a, 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 uh, a, a crazy thought when we think about the US and the massive amount of, of R&D that it funds and develops and drives for the whole world, not just for itself, but for the whole world. Um, being able to do that with a crypto network to me is like super, super fascinating. And um, hopefully we can do that for UBI and, and ending poverty even sooner. Uh, I think some of the most exciting projects are, are in the space. Now, one more question before, uh, I'm gonna open up to uh, the audience for questions, so if we can get maybe the mics set up and people start lining up. Uh, I'm gonna ask that people keep it brief, so really, you know, short questions so we can get to more questions. Um, all of you have lots of really thoughtful perspectives. Um, definitely, like, tweet out uh, uh, thoughts, uh, but keep, keep the questions shorter so that we can get to many more questions. Uh, while people are getting set up, um, I'll ask one more question. So. Uh, in the Falcon community, we love talking about preserving humanity's information for the future and for, um, to, to be able to be governed as a commons, to be used by, by many groups. Uh, I love asking people what, um, what, are, what is the, the information that they regard as deeply precious that they would like to make sure gets preserved for, uh, for posterity. You know, uh, I, I think about art and cultural artifacts, uh, and, and on a personal level, um, I like to write um, and, and I think that there are times when you have historical figures where you extract their writings and then you're, you're able to unpack some of what was going on in their head. Like, I, I would like us to be able to do that uh, for everyone, whether you're, you know, like an historical figure or not. Like, you, you, like imagine someone being able to uh, be able to trace uh, the, the evolution in, of someone's thinking um, generations after the fact. I think that that could be really powerful. That's wonderful. Uh, are, we, are folks ready for questions? Uh, don't be shy. Uh, let's bring up the lights in the room. Uh, please stand up and line up at the mics. Uh, here, over here. Hi, uh, my name's Eddie, and uh, Andrew, I wanted to ask you, do you think there's an opportunity for uh, economic inequality between nation states to be remedied by Web3? And if so, do you have any examples of how you think that might be tackled? Uh, did you say economic cooperation between nation no, states? No, ec economic inequality and the, the level of development in those countries. So if you look at, you know, HDI in different countries, like how you might kind of bring everyone to parity as opposed to having such a no, no, massive it's, gap it's, between it's them. A, it's a great question. Uh, and I'll take it from the American perspective. So the, the U.S. Donates a lower percentage in terms of international aid than uh, most of its peer countries, but if you go to Americans, uh, that the, they will get upset about <laughs> even the amount that, about that, that that's currently donated. Um, that the the fact is, so uh, I I kind of am a numbers guy and an efficiency guy, um, so my mind naturally goes also I'm, I'm Asian, so um, so my my mind naturally goes to where the the, the money can do the most good. Uh, you know, like if you put a thousand bucks to work in like a uh, uh, part of, uh, you know, like Africa or Latin America, you can have like an enormous impact in a way that a thousand bucks might not in a more developed community. So uh, I think that there are huge opportunities. And then one of the arguments you'd make that the U.S. is experiencing in a particular way is that if you strengthen other countries, you win too. Uh, and and uh, the reverse is, is true, where if a country does really, really poorly, and let's say everyone flees that country, and maybe the place they flee to is you. <laughs> so like, maybe it's like enlightened self-interest for you to invest in uh, uh, other uh, societies that are, are proximate to yours. Uh, I think that would be something that, um, that I would love to see uh, become mainstream and accepted policy. Thank you. Next question. Hi, uh, Jeff Hurley from London. Andrew, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm also a big believer of universal basic income. So what in, um, uh, Britain, British government is doing is cutting the taxes for the, the rich. They've taken away 45% tax rate for the top uh, 1%. It's exactly doing the opposite. So I was wondering if you are starting this B, uh, universal basic income campaign globally, not just in the US, and what are you doing in Europe, and you know, other countries as well. Uh, second question is, a lot of people believe in the US are so deeply divided because of its two-party system, <laughs> right? Are you um, gonna start a new party, have a third choice? That's probably a help. 
Oh, well, thank you for, on, on both fronts. Uh, so the UK is not alone in terms of its taxation and priorities. One of the things that the studies have shown is that if you have a vastly unequal society and you are at the top of that society, you are actually less happy than if you are at the top of a society that is more like balanced and equal. It turns out like just being in a vastly unequal environment makes you stressed out. <laughs> and so, so, so there are various moneyed interests who've said, hey, like lower my taxes, lower my taxes. Like it, it really is not very smart uh, because like, like, you're, like everyone wins if a society has a middle class and a bunch of other things. Um, I, I'm with you that UBI should be hopefully uh, in countries around the world, like I, I, you know, like I think if the US passes it, then a lot of Western European countries would be like, I can't believe the US actually did this before us. Um, so now we're gonna have to do it too, <laughs> is the thought. Um, in, in, the U, in the US, we are very, very divided. I don't know how many of you know that I started the third biggest political party in the country, in the US, and raise your hand if you knew that, the forward party, not left to right, but forward, that's what I've been up to. Um, so uh, I, I'm now the co-chair of the third biggest political party in the U.S. by resources, and the goal is to uh, reduce the polarization and give Americans uh, a sane, rational, results-oriented option. Um, because the two parties have become increasingly ideological. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah, because the, the two parties have become increasingly ideological, and they don't need to deliver anything that great. Um, because all they have to do is be like, look, the other side is evil, like, uh, so uh, vote, vote for us. Um, meanwhile, the U.S. has declined the 30th in the world in clean drinking water, public education, infant mortality, life expectancy. Uh, and by the way, that's why Americans seem like they're getting so angry uh, all the time, is that like, their quality of life's actually like, gone down <laughs> by, by, by a lot of measurements. So, uh, so that, that is uh, my, my main work right now. I'm going from here to Washington, D.C. for a, a pro-democracy event, and uh, I just came from Houston, Texas, where we launched the Forward Party of Texas. It was very exciting. Hundreds of people showed up, and I had this big event. I was on the local news, which was funny. At the after party, I went to the bar, and then I was on the news. Um, it's always a good experience. Um, so, so, so I'm trying to reduce the polarization in the U.S. by introducing this third party, and it turns out that 50 percent of Americans now say they're independents, 62% say they want a third party. So we have a lot, a lot of room to run. Yep. Next question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, hi, Andrew and Juan. I'm Sid. And both of you have inspired me to like, learn more about politics and Web3, respectively, in the last three, four years. Um, so I help steward a community of care called Kernel. And uh, like I've seen how grassroots efforts of resource allocation and fund allocation work effectively with quadratic funding and quadratic voting, like we have seen with Gitcoin. And we have also seen how centralized funding models work well when nation states do it well. So as someone who is good at understanding both nation states and communities, where do you think is the middle path for uh, Web3 to play a role in um, like allocation of resources, like people, funds, uh, and so on, when we talk about um, like improving equality and aspects like that. Thank you yeah. for, for the question. Yeah. Uh, so I've been a part of various uh, projects in Web3 that are trying to address poverty, and a lot of them get stuck at uh, the, at frankly, like the injection of value into the community. It's like they, what they do is they'll issue this thing and be like, hey guys, you all have this, this uh, token or, or currency, um, but then they can't necessarily use that to pay their bills, to buy food, to do all the things that, 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 that they want to do. Um, so th this is, to me, uh, one of the things that is addressable, but what it, it takes um, is conventional uh, philanthropic commitment. Um, and that could be from someone in Web3 or a company. And Filecoin, I, I will say, is, like, is, is fairly generous on this front, where they're, they're trying to invest in things that are, are, uh, are very regenerative and positive. Um, uh, and, and so I think if you can take that step, um, then you can see these projects uh, deliver a lot more impact. Um, one of the things that Juan and I were talking about is I think that there's a, a role for government. Here's, what, here's the way it works, ideally, in an ideal world. You have a philanthropic pilot that, the, that reaches a certain point, and then foundations come in, and then government comes in. 
And then government sees something that's happening and says, hey, if I put some value to work, then I can uh, expand uh, this impact significantly. That's the way it's supposed to happen. Uh, now, does it happen in every instance? Not necessarily. <laughs> but, but, but I think that that has to be uh, the, the approach you take uh, with, the, with a, a grassroots uh, effort. Um, you transition to philanthropy, and then ideally government is waiting um, at, as the next step. Thanks. Uh, I'll also uh, <clears throat> reference the whole uh, regenerative finance community in the Web3 space that is trying to figure out a lot of these questions. Um, uh, Funding the Commons, Shelling Point, Gitcoin, uh, all of these groups are trying to figure out like structures that can be scaled. Uh, so if you're interested, for the folks interested in that, uh, come join those communities. Um, I think next question over here. Um, so I'm a big fan of uh, effective altruism. And but as an American, when I speak to other Americans, I get a lot of like, oh, we should try solving problems in our own country first because naturally effective altruism um, is like, let's try to you know, maximize the amount of lives saved for a dollar spent. Do you have any strategies on like, or conversations that you have where like you can you know change people's mind toward like a more effective altruism method, or and then and or like some American uh, philanthropies that are doing like almost as high ROI work um, as some of the charities on effective altruism? I freaking love this question so much. Uh, how many of you know what effective altruism is? Raise your hand on that. If you don't, uh, it's doing as much good as you can for the most people taking into account future generations. So I had dinner with a guy named Will McCaskill, who's one of the progenitors uh, of effective altruism, and a guy named Sam Bagman fried who's another <laughs> uh, uh, um, big, big believer in effective altruism. And here was my pitch to them, and this is answering your question. So um, Sam Bagman fried is worried about problems that could affect uh, all of human life, including future humans. So what does that list look like? It could be, um, uh, bad or malignant AI, uh, it could be nuclear conflict, it could be future pandemics. Um, the, the one I, I'm particularly into, uh, you know, you can judge me, whatever, um, it is like uh, an extra ter terrestrial object hitting the earth and, uh, you know, like wiping everyone out. I mean, very low probability, but like if it happens, it's, you know, cataclysmic. Um, so, so the argument you make is like, if you look at these massive uh, species-wide problems, they are, uh, th preventing them is at a scale that is too big for, uh, for just about any individual or even philanthropy. Like even if you wanted to insure against future pandemics, you're looking at spending, uh, you know, let's say tens of billions of dollars and like there, there isn't anyone who can do that um, outside of government. So what Sam's argument is and Will's argument is that if you want to insure against these future risks, you need a functional government. And the problem is that our government is not functional, it's strictly short-term in thinking, it's very political and ideological. So the question is, if you were to spend, let's say, $5 billion making the American government more reasonable and rational, could you unlock 50, 100, 200 billion dollars to prevent pandemics, uh, you know, help, help make AI uh, less dangerous? reduce the chances of nuclear war, like et cetera, et cetera. So that's my argument to you and to anyone else is like, look, some of these problems are at a scale where functional government is the only realistic actor that can do anything about it. You know, like you and I aren't gonna prevent the asteroid. <laughs> you know, like, like there has to be like a freaking like space telescope and the rest of it. Anyway, um, so, uh, so my argument to them is like, let's spend the $5 billion to make our government work. Um, uh, and there are ways to make our government work if you spend the money. And I'm gonna give you guys just an example, it's, it's nerdy, but whatever. The problem in the American system is that the party primaries control everything and it distorts policy, it makes it so that the 10% of the most extreme partisans control who gets reelected. Um, you can change that system to nonpartisan open primaries and ranked choice voting like they did in one state in Alaska and then do it in states around the country and all of a sudden American policy would get more reasonable and rational. The cost of doing that is around $500 million with a success rate of 40%. Um, now, so one of the things I'm going around and being like, look guys, this $500 million is a freaking steal of a deal because if you rationalize this policy then you can wind up unlocking like, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of value. So that is my argument for the effective altruists, is like, look, I love 
trying to prevent starvation in poor places as much as the next person. I love it. Um, but some of the problems are going to require a different approach. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I got animated about that one. I literally, I mean, I had dinner with these guys, and I was like, come on, guys. Like, you know, I mean, like, we, like I get it. Government sucks. But we're going to need it to solve some of these problems. What are you going to do? How excited are they to, to, to do it? Yeah, there's no other way to do it. It's like, like, I mean, like, I love philanthropists, but, like, you know, you don't have tens of billions to, to address some of these thorny yep. problems. Yeah, we need massive macro-scale system change, um, especially the political structure. That needs to be broadly improved. All right, last question over here. Yeah, Andrew, thanks for the answer. I've actually been donating to EA for several years, and I completely agree what, with what you said. Uh, could you, so, speak up? Could you oh. enunciate a little bit more? And it's yeah. a little bit hard to hear because the mic has a reverb, so. Oh, OK. Is it better now? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, so my question was, I know that you've been doing venture for America for a while. And I think that we can all agree that there's a lot of venture capital money in Web3. So let's say, hypothetically, if you're able to do like, Web3 venture or venture for Web3 and was able to kind of do your own, what, how would you take it? And also, how do you want the VCs to kind of take, I guess, the influence and the capital I have right now to push for the good for the future? Oh, well, thank you for referencing my work with Venture for America. The idea of Venture for Web3 is fascinating. <laughs> I like it a lot. Uh, you know, and, and if I were to be pushing investors and create a Venture for Web3, it would be around these underserved communities that we're talking about and trying to expand the community um, to, to populations that right now you do not associate uh, with, with Web3. Web uh, and that's a very worthy vision. Like, I, you know, I hope someone takes that on. But I'm, I'm so glad that you actually, uh, you know, like referenced uh, like the, the work I, I did for years before I ran for president. So, so thank you on a personal level. Yeah, I actually voted for you as a president. I'm just sad they didn't make it. But hopefully next election, hopefully I can see well, you there. Well, well uh, apparently I have another 40 years in American life uh, <laughs> to, to, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you. I really thank appreciate you. it. You know, there's so many more impact or <laughs> There is dramatically more impact-oriented investors now. Uh, I think it would be great to uh, start that project. So maybe we'll talk later about starting um, uh, oh, if venture, anyone, if venture anyone, for Web3. Yeah, if anyone yeah. does it, it's going to be freaking yeah, uh, uh, you and Filecoin and well, everyone else you know. Uh, a, a lot. I'd like to end this with a, a huge thank you for all of the work that you do and for taking time out of your extremely busy uh, schedule in life to come speak with us. It means a lot to our community to hear from you um, and to be part of, um, part of the solution, part of uh, thinking about these problems, working on them, um, and so on. Uh, we, I think a lot of us took a, a lot of um, inspiration out of today, um, a clear look at the problems, a clear look at next actions. Uh, please, everybody who's part of this, uh, T like think, think for a few seconds of like, what are you going to do now that's different thanks to this conversation? Like, what are you going to shift your, how is that going to shift your priorities? What is the next action that you're going to take on this? These are massive challenges um, that Andrew's leading us on to try and, try and solve. So please, please help uh, solve the challenges of the future. Let, let's Thanks. let people know that the future can be bright. Thank you all very, very much. We appreciate the heck out of you. Thank you all.